Thank you very much. Yes. So uh, thank you everyone again uh, for joining us uh, for this meeting. Again, uh, this workshop on the LNE work program and the WIPO Broadcasting Treaty organized by the South Center, Knowledge College International, and PIGIF from the American University in Washington. It's a great pleasure uh, to have you all. I will, because we don't have much time, I will then pass on directly to our panel one, uh, which is uh, the presentation by uh, Mr. Mohamed Bakir from the Permanent Mission of the People's Democratic Republic of Algeria to the United Nations here in Geneva, who will be uh, making a presentation on the proposal uh, organized by the African Group on a work program on exceptions and limitations for copyrights. So uh, Mr. Mohamed Bakir, thank you very much again. Uh, you will have uh, 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, dear Victor. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, do you hear me very well? We can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Uh, at the outset, uh, I would like uh, to thank the South Center and partnering organizations for inviting me to take the floor in this timely workshop on copyright limitations and exceptions and broadcasting treaty in uh, preparation for the 42nd uh, session of the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights uh, to be held uh, uh, next month. Uh, as you all know, exceptions and limitations to copyright uh, have formed the core part of the agenda of the RCCR for a number of years, uh, following the successful, successful uh, agreement of Marrakesh Treaty in 2013. Uh, now, uh, which it is the fastest growing uh, legal instrument. Discussions continue to focus on uh, exceptions and limitations, especially for libraries, ar archives, and museums, but also for education and research uh, institutions and people uh, with other disabilities. Uh, although there has been a desirability uh, for a standing uh, sitting instrument on uh, limitations and exceptions, uh, unfortunately, little progress uh, has been uh, accomplished uh, in the discussions uh, around these subjects, with some members opposing uh, uh, the, the option of a legal instrument, despite the mandates given uh, by the General Assembly uh, in uh, 2012. Uh, as you recall, in uh, 2018, uh, at the 37th session of the RCCR, Member states agreed on uh, final action plans. Uh, these included a combination of typologies, studies, regional meetings, uh, and a final conference, which uh, was held in uh, 2019, as a means of advancing the discussions on limitations and exceptions agenda. Uh, fortunately, these activities helped build up an understanding of the legal situation for libraries, archives, museums, education, and research. But it highlighted the uh, particularly the need to improve the legislation, but also to, ad to address some of the challenges uh, related to cross-border and digital uses. The regional workshops uh, and the international conference also uh, underlined the relevance of and the need for an international action. In this context, and with a view to make, of making a substantial contribution to the work of the RCCR on limitations and exceptions, a proposal by the African group for a draft work plan on limitations and accepting and exceptions was put forward for consideration by the committee at its next session. The African proposal is in line with the original 2012 mandate in the sense that the activities listed therein should help advancing the ultimate goal of an international instrument or instruments for libraries, archives, museums, education, research and persons with other disabilities. Yet the proposal does not prejudge the form of any model or instrument resulting from the suggested activities and thus can be seen as expressing the current uh, consensus for action within the RCCR. It's also worth noting that the proposal is made with an open and with an open mind and in a constructive spirit and all members are welcome to provide their views and uh, inputs uh, to the draft uh, to improve it if, if uh, they wish so. Uh, with your permission, uh, I want to hit briefly uh, on the main points uh, of the work plan. Uh, in the optional paragraph one of, of the work plan, the committee will continue, as I said, discussion to work towards an appropriate international legal instrument or instruments 
on the limitations and exceptions, we, we, whether it be uh, model law, joint recommendation treaty, or other form. For libraries, archives, museums, education, research, and uses for other persons with disabilities. As you know, there has been a long-standing commitment to discuss potential international action around implementation of, of limitations and, and, and exceptions in order to adapt to the digital uses to deliver uh, public interest goals and to ensure uh, uh, these work uh, across borders. The Marrakech Treaty is one result of this process, but the business is not yet finished because action is needed on the rest of the agenda on libraries, archives, museums, education and research, and people with other disabilities. The, so this is the uh, idea behind the optional paragraph one, which calls for continuing the discussion uh, towards an international instrument. The operational paragraph two uh, states that work should be uh, undertaken uh, in order to reflect the priorities identified in the report of the regional seminars and the international conference. Uh, and what transpires from the, uh, these uh, events, the regional seminars and international conference, is the need to ensure that all laws enable preservation activities of libraries, archives, museums, including the use of preserved material across borders, and also the need to adapt to promote the adaptation of exceptions to the online and cross-border environment such as by permitting teaching, learning, and research through digital and online tools. Here it is important to highlight that the ACCR studies have shown that a large number of WIPO members have implemented new exclusive rights in the digital environment, often without updating relevant limitations and exceptions. The result is that the research, education, and cultural heritage activities in the digital environment are often disadvantaged. The report notes considerable agreement among member states on two main priorities, uh, priority areas listed above, which has to do with preservation and online uses. It, and uh, and the, 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 the participants in the uh, two events, uh, they uh, outlined the need to, uh, to allow exceptions under co national copyright laws but also to adapt these exceptions to permit, to permit teaching, learning, and research through digital and online tools, include, including cross borders. Operational paragraph three, requests the secretariat to sponsor presentations by experts at the next ACCR session in 2023 on the program of choice of law for cross-border uses of copyright works, such as in a class with students in multiple countries or where researchers are located in different countries or the subjects of their research are created or located in different countries. The session should consider international model for dealing with this problem. I would like here to emphasize that the report on regional seminars and international conference records substantial agreement that WIPO has a unique role in addressing cross-border issues with the use of limitations and, and, and exceptions. The issue could form a priority focus of the committee, including through an information session with experts at the next ACCA. Operational paragraph four uh, is about uh, organizing or advancing information sharing sessions and consensus building on the uh, point uh, one, two, and three between ACCR sessions, which may include uh, 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 intercession work, like a friend of the chair group that is transparent and inclusive, committees of experts preparing objectives and principles, or other models, provisions for consideration by the committee and other processes, because we need to go to text based the deliberations or negotiations. And this, this could, be, could not be possible without having an intercession work, whether in the form of, in the format of friends of the chair or uh, expect, uh, this is to be decided by the member states once we agree on the principle. Uh, in our view, in order to advance the, the agenda item, there is a clear need to adopt result-oriented approaches 
by using innovative methods to advance conversations between official meetings. We see that some members have criticized the process used in the last two, in the last years, especially in the last two years, to advance the text of the draft wipe broadcasting treaty. We feel we also feel that there is need to begin crafting provisions on focusing on objectives and principles as first step. And we see the positions of other uh, protagonists, and they can maybe be brought uh, on board if we limit the first step to the objectives and principles uh, and start uh, crafting uh, and drafting provisions. Now I pass to uh, op 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 optional uh, paragraph five. The Secretariat should convene information session and exchanges with member states, experts, copyright offices, and other agencies and beneficiary organizations, drawing on new and existing research studies where appropriate, including on the new uh, themes that have not been dealt with within ACCR until now, and which are very challenging and pressing issues. There is the issue of limitations and exceptions for text and data mining. There is the UNESCO recommendation on open science, which was adopted in 2021, and its implication on the international copyright laws and policies. And there is models for protection of limitations or exceptions. Although limitations of access are already facultative, voluntary, but even though they are not protected, they are not uh, uh, in, in uh, they can be subjected to override by terms of contracts. That's why there is need for safe harbor protection for educational research heritage institutions and also exceptions to need to technical measures of protection and rights management information to protect uses permitted by limitations and exceptions. It's worth mentioning that the text and data mining is an important aspect of limitations and exceptions for research. And it can be a source of many developments and evolution and progress. Uh, that's why this, uh, even though uh, these uh, have uh, been addressed in many recent copyrights uh, reforms, and we need to that uh, we took we look at it, uh, as many countries have uh, already made reforms in this regard. When we talk about the UNESCO recommendation on open science, uh, which was adopted as I said in 2021, it is the first international standard for open science. It contains useful recommendations on the use of. Uh, LNEs that are highly relevant to wipe work and to assist your agenda. This is a legal instrument that formulates principles and norms for international regulation of the topic uh, at hand. UNESCO and member states are invited also to take legislative and other steps that may be required to apply the principles and norms set out in the recommendation. The last category in uh, the three main points uh, of the uh, operational paragraph five uh, is about the uh, uh, what was what was raised in the uh, seminars and the international conference uh, about the list of issues, uh, especially the as I said, the, the, the data mining, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, issue of uh, uh, the technical measures for protection and how to protect the use of limitations and ex exceptions. Uh, from technical uh, measures. Uh, the paragraph uh, five recommends uh, that uh, we organize uh, information session on all these issues, drawing on new or existing uh, research uh, studies. Operational paragraph six uh, gives to the secretariat a mandate to develop two plates to guide uh, to, to toolkits to, to guide targeted technical assistance programs, which help the member states to craft laws and policies which supports education, research, and cultural participation. We feel that Secretary should be more active to allow to uh, members to get benefit from its expertise in, in crafting and uh, developing uh, 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 the legislation on, 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 on exceptions and limitations because there are, these are facultative and there needs to be uh, support to make them uh, work for the, for the system. As you know, member states have, uh, support, have expressed their support for uh, the work of the secretariat on, on toolkits and or other guide, 
And the paragraphs notes that guidance should be based on the work completed to date, such as existing studies on limitation and exception. It means that the secretary should draw on what have been accomplished till today uh, in the studies to uh, develop these two toolkits and guidance. And this should be done in consultation also with all the experts and the stakeholders, including the experts that have been mandated uh, and commissioned to do the studies so that uh, we can have a, a, a good to create that to toolkits that respond to the needs of member states. To sum up uh, the objective uh, before finishing, uh, I think that the, the, the proposal uh, aims to speed up the work of the ACCR towards the adoption of an international instrument. It, undertake, it, it implies the need to undertake activities on the issue of adaptation of limitations and exceptions to the digital environment to ensure exceptions for, especially for research and education uses. It undertakes uh, activities to support work on preservation activities for libraries, archives, museums, including the use of preserved materials across borders. And it tackles new issues that, that ACCR has not yet dealt with, dealt with, like data mining, text and data mining exceptions, open contract override, liability, safe harbor, or exceptions to technical protection measures. And it suggests to adopt an, an innovative working methodology to advance the work on limitations and exceptions, including via intercession work, as well as inclusive and transparent participation of all stakeholders in the, implement, in the conception and implementation of these activities. It's worth mentioning that the proposed work program has links to all to many DA recommendations, like the recommendation 1, 7, 9, 14, 32, and, and 40. And to, to get more information, you can see the annex to the work plan. This brief uh, introduction of the African proposal comes to an end, and I am delighted to take any question that you may raise. I thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mr. Mohamed Bakir, for this very comprehensive presentation. Uh, I would just ask everyone, please, if you could just include the name of your delegation or institution next to your name. That will greatly facilitate our engagement. I will now pass on to Professor Sean Flynn uh, for his brief remarks, followed by uh, the open discussion. Thank you. I think, thank you, everybody, and 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 thank you, uh, Mr. Bakir, for that uh, really really excellent summer summary of the African proposal. I just I just wanted to make a couple quick reflections, uh, just as an academic who has been following the SCCR uh, for a number of years, and then uh, as Vitor mentioned, uh, open it up for questions, discussion, comments um, from any anyone in the audience. So so please prepare those. Feel free to use the uh, participants flag to raise your hand and then I can um, you know turn to you uh, uh, right off the bat. But let, so let me just say again, you know as an academic who's been following SCCR for a number of years, um, you know my first and most important impression is that the, the African group proposal is really a, a good faith and, and rigorous effort to trying to find a way forward within the LNE agenda that really takes advantage of all the work that's been done um, in the last few years and the emerging uh, consensus that seems to be emerging on the priority issues within. So, uh, you know, I really applaud the Africa group for uh, uh, that effort and it really needed to be done. And it's really um, great to see that there's a, a large and important coalition within SCCR pushing those issues forward. A uh, couple of quick notes on some of the framing that I found really interesting, um, just reading through the proposal. I mean, the first on the, the first paragraph referring back to the, the General Assembly recommendation. I think it's important that the Africa proposal specifically mentions um, education and research as goals within themselves, not only tied to institutions. And I think if you see some of the agenda items are constantly reflecting on libraries and archives and museums, and then education and research institutions, which is one of the you know uh, framing of the LNE agenda going all the way back to 2004. But if you look at the evolution of the studies and the focus of the uh, uh, exceptions in those areas, they're not tied to institutions. So if you look at Daniel Sang's study, for instance, he's looking at private use and private study and individual, the rights of individuals within the copyright system. And so I think that's a proper reflection 
of the actual focus of l and &E and the needed. Uh, you know, what is really uh, a needed, especially for education research is individual exceptions, as well as, as, well as institutional exceptions. I think as, as Mr. Bakir noted that, um, I think that this is uh, an innovative proposal, especially in paragraph two, that focuses on the priorities that have emerged from the l and &E action plan. So this to me seems very responsive to the work that has been done in the past. It's not just re-articulating the same positions that have been going on for many years. Uh, it really is a good faith effort to try to respond to the emerging issues, especially on digital and cross-border and preservation um, that, that evolve from the materials that have been published uh, so far. I think the focus on, on really bringing in more expertise on the cross-border issues, I think is very prescient. I think these are sticky issues, they're difficult issues, and they haven't been fully aired within SCCR. And I think the call for, for more expert testimony on those is, is very wise. I think the ideas in paragraph four to bring some innovative mechanisms to get work done between the sessions is extremely necessary, especially if we're gonna start meeting maybe only once a year. So there, if, if this agenda item is gonna proceed, it's gonna to have to proceed through mechanisms between the formal SCCR meetings um, or really nothing will be done. And I see it taking some clues here from the IGC where a lot of interesting work um, is being done between the sessions um, that have really enabled um, uh, that process to move much faster than the SCCR. Um, I mean, I think that areas in, in, in paragraph five uh, are very much consensus issues to the extent they focus on information sessions. Um, and I think it clearly creates space for new studies and just one of the issues that, that, that our group has been working on, the Global Expert Network and Copyright User Rights specifically, is the lack of any real focus or studies on the issue of research exceptions uh, within the committee thus far. So there have been studies on libraries, archives, museums, um, and education but actually not research. There's at least one big lacuna there. Um, and finally, I, I see that the, you know, the last paragraph focuses on toolkits, et cetera, which is another consensus item, but makes it very clear that those um, should be participatory processes um, and should follow the studies to date. So just a quick you know, reflections from someone who's been watching and observing this process for a long time, that this seems to be a great place to start um, and I hope it leads um, to productive conversations uh, coming up. So with those um, just quick reflections, we're, we're open. And as Mr. Bakir noted, he's, he's willing to take questions himself. So let me um, <clears throat> recognize, switch over to my gallery screen. If you'd like to um, ask a question, um, you can raise your hand using the raise hand function at the bottom, or you can also just open up your uh, camera and, and come off mic and just speak directly. So does anybody have a question or comment? Jean Dryden from ICA. Great, welcome Jean. Yeah, good morning everybody. Uh, I represent the International Council on Archives at SCCR. And I would uh, like to thank um, Mr. Bakir and the Africa Group for um, a very, um, <coughs> strong proposal to advance the work on limitations and exceptions. Um, in general, I agree with much of what Sean has, has said. Um, I would just like to make two, two comments um, uh, in um, reference to um, paragraph 2b. Uh, um, I would really like to see included in uh, you know, cultural heritage activities included in 2B as well. Now, certainly libraries and archives and museums are indeed research institutions. So it's, uh, they're indirectly in there um, with the word research, but uh, I would like to see them explicitly mentioned, you know, like just by adding something like cultural heritage activities or something like that. Um, my second point is, it relates to paragraph three. Um, I and the call for more studies. I am generally not a big fan of more studies because in the past I, um, I quite frankly have viewed studies um, in, in part as a means of stalling things. You know, the secretariat um, in some respects is not necessarily interested in 
advancing this agenda. So let's have more studies and we can keep it on going on forever. But I was really pleased to see that the call for the studies in section three was very focused, particularly the, the questions of cross-border law. Um, you know, very focused, very narrow and, um, and needed, uh, much needed information for, um, you know, in to, to inform where we go from, from here. Uh, so those are my, my comments. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you very much for putting forward this proposal. I, you know, the ICA can strongly be in support of it. Thank you. And uh, Stephen Weiber, I see a question in the chat. Why don't we take a few questions and then Mohammed, you can make any res you know, responses to those comments or questions that you like. Um, Stephen Weiber, do you want to give your question? Just take your mic off. I can, I apologize. It's a day off here, so I'm not going to turn my camera on. Um, I, I, I think that it, it's quite a broad question, but just to get, get your views, Mr. Mr. Bakir, and, and and I guess potentially your views, Sean, as 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 an observer of, of these discussions of this process for many years now. What do you think are the consequences of not agreeing this proposal? What is the cost of of, of this not being moved forward at this meeting? Okay, a question on on what happens if we if we don't take this, and let me just hold that for just a second and see if there's any other comments or questions, and especially I want to welcome um, questions from the delegations. Now, Vitor, I noticed the recording button is still on. Do you want to turn that off? Yes, let's do this, particularly if uh, any delegations would like to take the floor. Yeah, I will do this now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vitor. And now we turn to part two of our workshop. And um, um, just to note, we actually have two panels um, to address the theme of appraising proposals for a WIPO broadcasting treaty in 2022 and its implications on access to culture and knowledge. And uh, I will now introduce the first panel of two distinguished speakers uh, to address the chair's new text, what is protected, what rights are granted, and for how long. And will that change the distribution of licensing revenues and the ability to clear rights? And the first speaker we have is uh, Mr. James Love, Director of Knowledge Ecology International. Uh, he's training in economics and finance and has been, um, as far as I know, um, really been involved in various negotiations at WIPO since the 1990s. And, uh, in terms of access to knowledge, um, more recently, especially involved in the negotiations leading up to the WIPO Marrakesh Treaty for the Blind. Uh, and then I'm also happy to introduce uh, Mr. Eri Prasaccio from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Indonesia. And I should add that he's speaking in his personal capacity, but I also feel compelled to uh, inform you that you know, he, uh, of his portfolio now. He's in charge of intellectual property and trade dispute settlement issues. And uh, he also covers all intellectual property norm setting issues within WIPO. And previously when he was posted uh, here in Geneva, he represented Indonesia at WIPO and was the former um, coordinator of the Asia Pacific group. So each of you uh, will have 15 minutes. So I We'll turn it over to you, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you, Thru. Um, I, I'd like to start by talking briefly about the, the history of the um, of, of, of the Rome Convention negotiations. In, in, in a, uh, the broadcast treaty at White Boat is is really thought of as, as a follow-on to the to the Rome Convention of, of 1961. Uh, which was a, a, a treaty on related rights involving uh, three parties, uh, performers, producers, and broadcasting organizations. Um, <clears throat> prior, to, prior to the development of sort of these regimes of related rights, the, the principal mechanism of protection was copyright. And if you were a, an actor, or if you were a singer, or you played the violin, or a, a performer of any type, 
your rights were, were based on a contract you'd have with a copyright holder. And there was a, uh, um, uh, when the, there was, a, you know, at the end of the, of the 19th century, there was a development of really uh, phonograms and radio and eventually television. And during that period, it really radically changed the way people uh, would, uh, you know, the relationship between art and the role of performers. And performers became quite a bit more famous in this period where you had uh, uh, the, the ability to, uh, to broadcast through the radio or television, for example, performances. And uh, it, it was more or less a, a labor initial uh, a negotiation. I mean, the, the ILO, the uh, International Labor Organization was one of the principal uh, parties in, in, in the negotiations on the Rome Convention. Uh, but these two other groups of uh, uh, producers of phonograms, which I think people that listen to popular music now would recognize the, the, the role of, uh, of, of producers of phonograms as being actually a pretty, uh, playing a pretty important creative role. So you had these performers and the producers of phonograms, which had a clear role in the, in, 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 in playing a creative role in, in, in art, uh, we're going to be, were the two of the parties. The third party, the broadcasters, was kind of an odd fit for the things because they, they really had nothing to do with uh, the creation of a creative work. They were a, a more of an industrial role, but they, uh, they had a strong lobby. And uh, uh, I think one of the arguments you had for broadcasters is the services were provided free to the public uh, they, there was there was initially not there was no role for uh, paywalls uh, or, or you know are just very limited I mean for most 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 radio and broadcast televisions in that period the period leading up to 1961 were all over the air and uh, and 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 many of the radio and television broadcasters had public service obligations and they were included uh, in the Rome Convention but the Rome Convention it was interesting because there was a lot of tension between the broadcasters and the performers and the uh, producers, the, the concern was uh, that the broadcasters didn't want to pay money to the performers and producers if they broadcast their works. And the performers and the producers didn't want the broadcasters to get paid um, uh, or to get portions of the money that they thought they should get uh, when their works were broadcast. So there was, a, uh, there was and, and to this day, uh, th this tension exists between the people that are the uh, the creators of works and the people that are just distributing them. If you want to have an analogy, you could look at the difference between theaters, for example. Theaters were, were, were a way of showcasing motion pictures uh, through a paywall. I mean, it, you had to pay money to go to a theater. You did not have to pay money to watch television in most countries, uh, except for maybe the UK, where they, they look for antennas on your houses. But Normally, that was the distinction. And uh, there was no attempt to create a, a related right for theaters, for example, or in the case of people that sell books for, for bookstores or record stores, but there was for television and, and, and radio. The, the Rome Convention, when it was a, a first adopted, it was, it was relatively slow uh, in, in terms of its, its adoption. I, I'll just say a few things additionally about the, the Rome Convention. There, were no, there was no three-step test. There was a set of uh, enumerated exceptions, which were, uh, which were an important part of the negotiation. Uh, initially, um, after after the treaty was in effect for uh, uh, for the first ten years, only twelve states had had joined the convention. And if you fast forward today, uh, the convention has uh, roughly half the number of parties as the Berne Convention does. Um, and many of the parties that have joined the convention in recent years have done so at the behest of uh, the European Union, which is a strong supporter of the Rome Convention a related rights model and which is obligated countries entering into trade agreements with the European Union to ratify the Rome Convention. Um, uh, in contrast, uh, the first nine years of the Marrakesh Treaty had, uh, had uh, uh, 88 parties compared to only 12 parties uh, to the Rome Convention in its first 10 years. Um, the, the Rome Convention was followed up by the Brussels Convention, which was uh, an important model because the Brussels Convention was, was not about creating a related economic right 
as the Rome Convention was about. The Rome Convention was not about anti-piracy so much as it was about creating an economic right uh, and things that were uh, uh, for, for the performers, for the producers, but for the broadcasters as well. The Brussels Convention did not go down that path. The Brussels Convention for satellite uh, uh, transmissions, uh, for, uh, first of all, uh, it was a sort of a business to business uh, convention. It, it, it excluded, for example, direct broadcast satellites. So it excluded broadcasts that went directly to consumers that were uh, where the signals were encrypted and you had a paywall. Uh, it was an anti-piracy convention. The structure was different in the sense that countries are given a lot of flexibility in their national law to figure out the measures that were necessary to prevent piracy of the satellite um, of the satellite transmissions. There were three exceptions that were spelled out in the Brussels Convention. Um, uh, one was for uh, on current events, which is similar to the Berne Convention on uh, 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 pub, you know, public affairs and, and, uh, and, and news of the day. There was a, a quotations exception, and there was one for science and education. Now, the, the white ball treaty that's being negotiated right now, the discussions began in 1997, and they've gone on for a really long period of time. This, I would describe this as sort of three different phases. The first phase, I think, was an attempt by the broadcasters to have a, um, a convention that applied to them and did not apply to other parties. And it was sort of a, a, a super Rome convention. They wanted to take the Rome Convention, and they wanted to extend it uh, in certain ways. They wanted it to, uh, uh, to, to have some of the um, additional rights that were included in the WIPO Copyright Treaty. They wanted to, uh, um, they wanted to uh, include things like technical protection measures. They had, um, um, they, 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 they model it sort of on the Rome, but you know, basically with new and expanded rights. There was an early debate too about whether or not webcasting should be included. And that was a, a position that was controversial at the time because most broadcasters did not, traditional broadcasters pushing for this did not consider themselves webcasters. Then I'd say uh, there was a pushback on this. Sorry. Yeah, there, been uh, there was, there was a, a, a pushback at, at, at a certain point, particularly in the period probably from like 2003 or 2004 up to around 2013, um, to have, to have a, a different way of thinking about the broadcast treaty, because there was more and more attention to how the broadcast treaty would play out if it was applied to the internet. And the concern was that if you applied the broadcast treaty to the internet, you'd have a lot of really unintended consequences. Why don't they're intended or unintended, but they would be bad. Now. If you look at traditional analog over the air television radio, there was, there was certainly people that would be like recording music or recording television broadcast using analog recording methods, but it was not a huge issue in terms of the quality and, and the competition that might have with the original versions. And there was also not a lot of people themselves being the originators of content. It was a, a very difficult to set up a radio and a television station in the internet, it became ridiculously easy for people to do this. Anyone with a cell phone today can become a broadcaster just by downloading an app and uploading something to one of a million different uh, social networks that provide those services. Um, uh, the cost of becoming a broadcaster was approaching zero. And, uh, uh, and you had uh, the, the development and explosion of a lot of user-generated uh, content. This particular seminar, for example, is gonna probably end up on YouTube. It will be uh, co-sponsored by American University, which has a broadcast license, uh, a radio station, and it will be effectively protected by the broadcast treaty in the current uh, version of the text, as well billions of other uh, works that people are uploading uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and another thing that happens on the internet is things go viral. You'll see things that start out in one platform and they'll end up in other platforms. People take cer certain extras, they kind of repurpose things, they may modify them, they may include them in documentaries, they may do a million different things. And so the, the, the reuse of material has exploded with digital technologies but, and the, the combination of digital technologies and the internet. Now, the concern people would have is that if, if it's easy to qualify as a protected 
uh, war, a, a protected action, that you'll have a whole series of rights that you'd have to clear. So instead of having to, instead of having to deal with like, you know, the copyright owner or the performers, you'd have to maybe consider not only the original broadcast entity, but anyone that had subsequently done this. The other thing is that the broadcast treaty does not limit the rights to broadcasting organizations that have any relationship to the creator of, of the information. So if you have a Creative Commons license or something in the public domain or something that's pirated or something that's just uploaded voluntarily on something uh, through somebody's cell phone, no matter whether the broadcaster had paid anything, would ever intend to pay anything, had any contractual arrangements, or it had even infringed, it wouldn't make any difference. They would have the broadcaster right completely separate from any attempt to obtain any legal right uh, in the works. They would be, it would just be like automatic. And so you'd be uh, uh, conveying on whoever was qualified for that right. Now, when they, initially there was a talk about this being limited to traditional broadcasters, but if you look at the current draft, that's really gone. Uh, that's like years, years behind us. Right now, it's uh, the big emphasis right now is on time and place of the, of, of the choosing. And that's because everyone understands the entire future of broadcasting right now is streaming over the internet. And uh, what people really want is they want to be able to, you know, some things they want live, like they want sporting events live, they'll like news broadcasts live and certain other events live. But most things they want are things uh, in a much more preferred basis where they can actually decide, oh, do I want to watch this at, at you know, at, at 3.37 in the afternoon or do I want to watch it at nine o'clock at night? And they want to be able to, to decide whether they want to watch it on Thursday, Saturday or next, next month or next year. So the treaty includes things where it's not really broadcast. You're just essentially clicking on, you know, some link somewhere to, to create, uh, to start a stream of something that's stored on a server somewhere. And the, the things that are protected essentially under the treaty are only limited by whether or not you can claim to be a broadcasting organization, which is not really defined very, you know, very, very, very narrowly uh, in the proposed text. Now, at this point, uh, uh, one of the original arguments for the broadcast treaty was it had to do with sporting events and that, you know, and it needed it because people were claiming that sporting events were like somehow not protected by copyright or, and during this, and during the negotiations, the question was always posed to uh, the advocates of the broadcast treaty. Can you point to a single country where it's legal to broadcast um, uh, sporting events without uh, obtaining rights from the people that put the event on. I mean, you know, I mean, we, we had an open mind, like, okay, maybe it is like not protected somewhere. Can you give us like one country where it's not protected? And we never got an answer to that question. So I think that like a lot of things in the broadcast treaty, it's, it's, it's confusing what the, the whole purpose of the treaty, is it about piracy? If so, why don't they take the Brussels um, convention approach? The idea of very thin protection, um, and no economic rights. If, if it's about uh, economic rights, uh, why is that necessary? Because these services are, by, by and large, um, require subscriptions, uh, passwords. Uh, they require uh, people to pay money. Um, it, it's interesting also, if you go back to the Rome Convention to see how the difference between cable services, which required you to pay to have access in general, and are often encrypted uh, in terms of the, to the user were different than over the air broadcast. Now the European Union pushed the rights of the Rome Convention to cable operators. And I think they've tried to basically follow that path uh, here and now trying to extend these things to the internet. But what you're doing is you're creating a right to people that distribute works that don't create them, don't own them, don't license them, may even infringe them may even uh, make them uh, uh, assert rights contrary to the interest of their creator, like for example, through uh, works protected by Creative Commons. And they wanna have a narrower set of exceptions and exist uh, under copyright. I mean, the copyright now is set as the maximum uh, ceiling on exceptions, but it's also subject to a three-step test, which does not apply in the burn, for example, for education or quotations or news of the day. So it's the worst set of exceptions for someone that's done nothing to create the works, because if they did anything to create the works, they'd have separate rights through copyright or performance rights. And they haven't done, and, and this right is for people that have not done those things. This is, this is, this is a completely different right. So um, uh, this is, in our mind, it's a, it's a very dangerous 
treaty that will have enormous impact um, uh, in a negative way on access uh, to works. And it will it also shift income from, uh, uh, from what you've seen in the past to very large companies, primarily located in Europe and the United States or China, uh, 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 that are increasingly being subject to mergers and acquisitions uh, that have the economies of scale to, to basically offer enormous things. And particularly, if, if I'm going to have put in the chat one link to uh, streaming services, you can. And this is this is you know current, but this this changes every day with mergers and things. But you can sort of see the. Uh, uh, the big role by uh, uh, Paramount Plus, by Amazon, by Yahoo Sports, by uh, uh, by by you know all these different companies, they will all qualify under the treaty because all they have to do is to own one broadcast uh, uh, facility somewhere in the planet. And in the past, uh, these companies have all shown that they can do that. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, Ari, I'll turn over to you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much and good good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank AI so the Center and PG for organizing this very important workshop. And I think it's very important because uh, especially for for someone like me who is following uh, who, who, who uh, that, that has a WIPO on his portfolio, but really not an expert uh, perhaps on lim uh, limitation and exceptions or even a uh, broadcasting issue. Uh, before I, 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 I make my, my some, some, some remarks with regard to the issue that Tiru has, has presented me to, to, to speak uh, today, uh, I would like to say some disclaimer, first of all, that, that whatever I say will be my personal view. It, it, it doesn't represent position of any country or government. And again, a uh, more important disclaimer is that I'm not an expert, especially on broadcasting issue, uh, but uh, quote unquote, I'm just lucky enough uh, to, to be able to follow the debate on, on the negotiation of broadcasting treaty in, in a CCR, both in a CCR and, and nationally in, in Indonesia. And another disclaimer would be, I will, not, I will try my best not to repeat what James has uh, eloquently on, to outlined and stated to that so that we can we can really make use of our time to, to discuss further. So I would like to start with, with, with maybe policy concerns with regard to this issue on, on the new chair text that Tiru has presented. So I think it, it's nice, especially for me, who is not an expert, to try to, to, to be uh, maybe to take a step back and, and, and take a look at, at, at the ongoing policy debate with regard to the negotiation, the negotiation of broadcasting treaty in a more, I'm not gonna say balance maybe because that's too much, but, but in a more neutral way by checking all the facts. And if you take a step back and act like, like you're, you're, you're the audience of a, of a performance, usually you get, uh, you, you get a better chance of, of understanding things in a bigger picture. Uh, so again, I, I do, when I prepare for, for, for this event, I, I try to go back again on, on a very basic thing on what is neighboring rights or related rights. And this is what we're actually discussing about, about uh, in the broadcasting treaty. It's not, it's not a copyright in the sense of literary and artistic work like the Berne Convention. It's a neighboring rights or related rights, which is actually right granted to those who assist uh, the author of creator of a copyrighted work, but do not qualify for copyright protection in said works that, that they actually assisted to disseminate. And this includes uh, the rights of broadcasting organization. And James has already outlined the history of Rome, so I will not repeat that, but I think I just want to highlight some, something on, on what has been changed since Rome, that there are demands to have broadcasting treaty. Uh, so we heard the, the argument that, that what has been changing is that there are new ways of transmission, and hence there are new ways of signal theft or signal piracy, and they want to be protected. But they never really uh, the demanders again. Here I am. I'm not. I'm, I'm just trying to be neutral and try to take a look at at, at, at what is really happening. Yes, there are new wave transmission and there are new ways as well to do signal piracy or signal theft. But there are also new way of controlling access. You know, before the, there is no TPM, like like James has already mentioned about encrypt and encryption as well. So, so yes, at, at that time and and then and then James has also mentioned about at, at during Rome conventions time. Uh, broadcasters has has this public uh, public duty to actually disseminate information, knowledge, and 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 copyright works 
through the broadcasting so that, so that the wider public can enjoy it. And, and, and it was not cheap to actually, you know, set up your, your, your very, very high antenna for, for your broadcasting and everything. So there is this rationale to, to, to really uh, in, incentivize broadcasters at that time because it's not just for their investment, but also on, on their public duty to actually make sure people everywhere can access information. Uh, but, but now uh, technology has also changed and, and, and now the, in, uh, and James has already touched upon this issue. At that time, they cannot even pick and choose who get to, who get to access their broadcasters, right? If, if you have a TV or an antenna, you, you, you get to see what is being broadcasted. Or if you have a rad radio, you, you get to listen what is, what is on on the radio. But now uh, broadcasters today, there are new way of transmission and new way of controlling access. They, they make me pay. Like, like for example, a lot, of, a lot of broadcasting things that I enjoy right now, I actually have to pay already. So, so, so again, another argument on, 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 there are a lot of investment that they, we need to incentivize broadcasting to do, to, to do their things. Well, it's still there, but, but maybe if, if we really take a step back, it's, it's not really uh, the strongest argument that, that, that the demanders of this treaty have. But, but I still have to, to, to admit that they still have some role in making sure that dissemination uh, to, to in, of information and, and cultural products of the public still happen. And, and this brings me to, to, to the idea of, of the definition of communication to the public, because, because the way we understand communication to the public is that, is that uh, making any copyright work available or any work, maybe not even copyrighted work, any work available for being seen or heard or otherwise enjoyed by the public directly or by any other means, other than by issuing copies of such regardless uh, work, whether, uh, whether the public actually can see, hears, otherwise enjoys the work made available. So it is, it is important to note that when they actually, when they actually able to control the access, is it, is it really still broadcasting? Because people, people still need to pay. Some, some public still need to pay some, some, some part of broadcasting. I cannot really enjoy everything that BBC broadcasted today compared to in 1960 or 1970s, for example. Uh, so because there, there are a lot of, lot of other TPM things that, that, that BBC contents are actually doing. Uh, so this is one thing that, that maybe we as the public and maybe a lot of experts can also enlighten uh, someone like me who, who is just following the negotiation but not really uh, doing a broadcasting issue day on day to day basis, right? I'm just taking care of broadcasting issues when it's time for our CCR. But what, what about downloading, streaming or making available other means this is not communication to the public and we heard the demanders sometimes cite the, the role of communication to the public as, as why they need this, 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 this treaty. And another, uh, be, before we really go to the chair stats, another, another thing as a policy concerns that, 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 that we need to, to actually reflect is, is this, this dichotomy of, of different views. On the other side, there are people, there, there, are, there are actors who say that this treaty is urgent and important. And on the other side, you, you have member states or even other actors that say this treaty is unnecessary and harmful. I will not uh, go, I will not really uh, uh, try to outline what, what are the, the different arguments between these two camps, but I think what, what a lot of member states is trying to do and trying to understand the SCCR is try to find a middle ground here, not just, not just on one side, we do not want another copyright treaty that is imbalanced. So on the new chair stacks, I think what is protected is actually like, like what has been presented, the new chair stack is trying to give to, to, to agree on a treaty that is technologically neutral for broadcasting and its retransmission. And I will, I will touch upon the issue of retransmission later uh, to all broadcasters, but, but interestingly, they, they, they try to make it clear that this will exclude webcasters. Uh, and then, uh, and based on the article 2A of the terror text, the, the way the chair is trying to, to push for the definition of broadcasting is actually include a transmission of our computer networks, even though the chair has made a very careful note that if member states decides that transmission of our computer networks uh, to be carved out, they can do so within the provision on the scope of protection. But then this is also something that required careful uh, attention and consideration by all parties, since if this definition is agreed, uh, this, this definition will be uh, an international minimum legal standard for, for member states who are actually ratified this. So this will also change the definition of broadcasting in a lot of jurisdiction. Uh, whether, or, whether or not the scope of the protection will include transmission of our computer networks in the treaty, you know, because the treaty will supposed to be a minimum legal protection. So if the definition of broadcasting will include computer uh, transmission of our computer networks, some member states might actually can grant 
uh, protection as well on transmission over computer networks, even if the treaty say that 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 it is not 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 recognized internationally by this treaty. And then what rights what rights are granted? I, I think James has already outlined a lot of, of things because this is what James actually is essentially uh, put the highlight on the, this 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 is rights that are, that are putting uh, another layer within the copyright uh, regime and. The terms of protection is 20 years, but but one thing that, that, that we all need to to really be careful with regard to the chair tax is that uh, it it does it it says it also includes retransmission, but it's not really clear whether or not the language whether or not that means only applied to the first transmission or also repeat broadcasters. These 20 years, or uh, repeat broadcasting, I mean. Because if repeat broadcasting are also applied, then it might be uh, the terms of protection might be might be in perpetuity and so this is this is one thing that is that is that, 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 that we need to see and i think with with regard to the other thing will this change the distribution of licensing revenue and the ability to clear rights there is no two way about it there is no two way around this if there is a new exclusive rights that this treaty is supposedly want to grant to broadcasting signals it will add to, to the complexity of of rights uh, of rights clearance and and this is this is why, at the very minimum, I think the the next panelists will be very very important. The discussion on the next the next panelists because we will need to safeguard if this if this treaty is to be agreed, we will need to safeguard uh, the public interest uh, with regard to access to information and culture and knowledge uh, through an LNE provision or limitation and exception provisions that are prescriptive, just like what James says. The Rome Convention has a as a prescriptive. LNE. So this treaty has to have a prescriptive LNE because again, uh, since since the uh, you know since WCT WPPT, we have been expanding. We have been expanding protection and rights to the right holders, but the way the LNE has been drafted is also only the three-step test essentially. So we have been harmonizing rights and protection, but we never want to harmonize limitation and exceptions at the global level. This, this will make the International Treaty on Copyright imbalance. If you want to expand protection and harmonize protection and rights, then we need to also expand and harmonize uh, limitation and exceptions on those rights. Otherwise, we will have a very balanced uh, copyright system globally. And this is very important, at, at least for, for me, who is a, even though I'm speaking in, in my personal capacity, but whenever I, I'm, I'm putting my head as a government official, I'm not here representing just one part of my public, but I'm also representing the whole public in general so that we need to make sure that, that, that any treaty will be balanced uh, as the rational of any copyright regime. So in reflection, I think one thing, this, this will be my last part, uh, just, just, just for our reflections later on and discussion after the second panel. First of all, we need to make sure that the process in SCCR is balanced. We need to take, we need to see that right now the process is chair stacks. And personally, chair stacks is good, I think, because you will have a clearer text every session to negotiate. But then, it also has some some disadvantage. The disadvantage is uh, because. Because the chairs text try to simplify things, and then the chairs the chairs decide on on what what would be the middle ground. But but there is no record of what is actually being taken away, which whose proposal has been taken away by the chairs compared to the last negotiation. So a lot of delegates are actually do not understand the context on why the provision on this article, for example, uh, sounds like this. You know. Uh, a lot of a lot of delegates will, will miss the context and the evolution or history of, 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 of any language that is right right now in the chair stack. Another thing that, that I think that is very peculiar with regard to the chair stacks, and I think everyone should should know this, is that if you take a look at the SCCR list of document compared to other uh, committee in WIPO, for example, IGC, they will mention that this is chair stack. Even in SCCR, huh, the, the 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 chairs the chairs table or NLE. The title in the in the SCCR website, if you try to download the document, it says it's chairs, chairs, chairs list of something on, on limitation and exceptions, right? Take a look at, at the SCCR website for on the text. They didn't even include the term of chairs text. If you take a look at the at the title of the text in the website of the SCCR, if you try to download it. The, the title is just that this is the new text for the broadcasting treaty. So Again, a lot of people who doesn't really follow SCCR, they might miss the context or the evolution on why such things are there, on, on why here is, and, and I think this, is, this, this has something to do with, uh, I think this reflects that transparency are not really optimum. I'm not saying that there is no transparency, transparency are not really optimum. And, and speaking on my personal experience, even the, the, the dynamics of the friends of the chair team was a bit, 
weird at least for me because Indonesia made it very clear that we want to be included and we never even get any contact from the from the chair nor the secretariat with regard to what Indonesia why Indonesia is a member state again here I'm still speaking on my personal capacity but we might bring it up uh, as, 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 a, as Indonesia in at, at the next meeting uh, so that's on the process another reflection would be would be what's important for me is 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 to make sure that term of protection will not include any repeat broadcasts I think this, this this is very important, and then ensure that our that access of content that are not protected by copyright or already in the public domain are not going to be covered by this signal protection. And important as well is that limitation and exceptions need to be more prescriptive and harmonized, not just copy pasting uh, another three step test kind of provision, which is just one article and then let member states decide on what kind of limitation and exceptions are suitable with regard to these new rights that 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 we will that we will agree on so i think how to move forward is that uh, we need to to make sure that that this that the debates are more transparent and more balanced transparent uh, with regard to the process more balanced with regard to if rights are expanded then lne should be expanded if rights are harmonized then lne should be harmonized and i and in closing i would just like to to note that that whatever I say here, I, I checked on, on 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 one document that that UNESCO Executive Board has men, has been mentioning when India brought this issue in UNESCO. Actually, in line with with, with, with what I have been saying, it's it's and it's not trying to take side. It's not trying to pick one camp between those who are saying this is important and urgent versus those who are saying this is unnecessary, harmful. But if you really if you really try to stand in the middle, this is the view or the image that that you see. I think that's it for now, Tiro. I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ari. And uh, we'll have a rich uh, discussion session, but uh, for right now, I wanna proceed uh, immediately to the next panel. Like we have an August uh, panel as well. And we have uh, three panelists. Uh, they are Teresa Hackett, Teresa Nobre, and Luis Villarroel, and they will, address the following. The treaty, the broadcasting treaty, what are its implications on the right to education, research, uh, preserve, and training, and teaching? And I'll briefly introduce the three speakers. Uh, the first is Teresa Hackett, who is a Copyright and Libraries Program Manager at the Electronic Information for Libraries, an international NGO that works with libraries in developing countries and transition economy countries to enable access to knowledge. Uh, Teresa has been involved in national copyright laws to support libraries and their users, as well as at WIPO on the limitations and exceptions agenda. Teresa Nobre is a lawyer based in Lisbon. Uh, she's a legal advisor at Communia International Association for the Public Domain and uh, the Creative Commons Portugal chapter lead. Uh, Luis Villarroel is the director of Innovarte, based in Chile, and he is a former vice chair of the WIPO Standing Committee on the Copyright and Related Rights, and a former negotiator for both Chile and Ecuador, and uh, a, a judge at the Chilean Industrial uh, Property uh, Court. Um, so um, each of you has, I would say, yeah, uh, 10 minutes each since you're three. Uh, so, Teresa Hackett, uh, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tiru, and thanks to everybody for uh, for your presentations um, that are, as ever, very informative. And if I may, I'm going to share my screen um, with a couple of slides. So, if you could just let me know, are you seeing my screen okay? And uh, let me make that. Into a Maybe in presentation mode? Yes, Perfect. presentation mode, there we go. And if they're not moving on when I think they're moving on, let me know. <laughs> Thanks very much. So, um, so radio and television broadcasting has had a, a major influence in shaping our political and our cultural and our economic uh, social lives in the 20th and the 21st century. And a couple of years ago, um, at the launch of a 5 million Euro archiving project to safeguard Irish broadcast heritage, the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland 
noted that uh, the, the that television and radio programs are just as important in terms of our cultural and social heritage as printed materials held in uh, libraries and, and in museums. So I think from that perspective, I think it's a little bit um, strange that in the preamble that there's no clear public interest provision. So there is one preamble that states, as I've put on my slide here, desiring to develop and maintain the international protection of the rights of broadcasting organizations in a manner as balanced and effective as possible. But it's not clear, at least to me, if that balance refers to the rights of broadcasters and the rights of copyright holders. And if it is, if it should be a public interest balancing clause, it's, it's pretty weak. And if we compare the uh, recitals or the preambles to other recent uh, WIPO treaties, there are much stronger uh, provisions uh, on public interest. And in fact, the language is replicated in many of the recent treaties, the larger public interest, particularly education, research, and access to information. And in previous treaties like Rome and in Bern, where there aren't preambles, at least in those treaties, you do have exceptions including mandatory exceptions in the Berne Convention. And I think what's also um, uh, you know, interesting is that over the last number of years, we have seen the vital role of the television played during the COVID pandemic. So millions of people around the world uh, tuned into, turned on their television to get news, up-to-date news of what was happening with the virus locally and, and globally as well. We watched our televisions to keep us entertained during lockdowns, and television helped to keep our children learning during the, the, the lockdowns. And public service broadcasters in many countries developed educational programs to provide access to distance education and to ensure continued education for children at all levels, so pre-primary, primary, and secondary education as well. And UNICEF have uh, noted that 77% of countries included television in their national response to the COVID school closures. And the European Broadcasters Union estimates that educational content from public service media reached one in five children in Europe during the first full week of lockdown. So public uh, television services provided a vital public interest role during, uh, during the COVID pandemic. So I'm going to give um, a couple of examples of the uses of broadcast material in libraries for research and study in higher education and university education, and then for civic education and community information through uh, generally through public libraries. So in terms of um, uh, research and study, typically a library has a collection of uh, historical films or documentary materials which are used by students and by lecturers as primary sources of research material. So for example, the University of Botswana has a special collection on black history and the teaching of, of black history. The American University in Armenia supports, uses documentary films to support their teaching on genocide studies. In Latvia, there is a project to digitize Latvian television broadcasts from 1963 to 2012 that includes news, documentaries, children's programs, music and entertainment, about 8,000 uh, 8, hours of broadcast material. So all of this is very important to support education and research across a range of studies. So not only film studies that you might think is the obvious one, but also history and social sciences um, as well. In uh, Botswana, the public libraries provide access to radio and TV programs for educational and community purposes. So very popular in, in Botswana are the opening of parliament, um, independence celebrations, President Day, President Day celebrations, and the wildlife programs for children are particularly popular. In Senegal, uh, UCAD celebrates World Environment Day, and they will show films for World Environment Day. So we need exceptions for broadcast material to cover these types of uh, public interest uses. Now I'd like to make a special plea for preservation because if material, uh, broadcast material is not preserved, well, it just won't exist. 
and it won't be available for study and research or any other purpose. And I think it's important to note that long term preservation is a specialist task, either for analog material or for digital material. And it, it, it's, it requires specialist skills, specialist equipment to, uh, to, to unpack then all the elements of that broadcast. So it might be still soundtracks, footage, format, formats, migration and technical obsolescence because broad preservation doesn't only happen once it tends to be an ongoing process that um that that continues the material makes the material accessible into the future and i think we can't leave preservation only to individual broadcast organizations or individual organizations we know that there's been um many examples around the world of important socially important television programs that have been lost or missing episodes and indeed um, broadcasters sometimes put out calls to the public to ask if they can help find some missing episodes. We had the famous uh, Doctor Who uh, from the BBC in the UK a number of years ago. And we also know that broadcasters work with these specialist archives and libraries with this specialist knowledge to preserve their materials. So they have partnerships um, with, with, with other organisations. We can't also leave preservation only to the market, because in that case, then only programs that might be considered profitable in the future would be digitized, because preservation is an expensive business. And it's, as I said earlier, it's an ongoing business that requires um, constant updating. So libraries, archives and museums must be allowed to freely preserve these types of works without um, legal impediments. So. Any new treaty on broadcasting must have robust mandatory exceptions. Otherwise, the implications to answer the question are it will become more difficult to clear rights for institutions and more costly for publicly, institu publicly funded institutions to reuse this material. Um, access to broadcast material for education, culture and for people with disabilities will reduce. The orphan works problem will increase. Um, with this new right, uh, and, and particularly with this term of protection that we heard about earlier. And in a post Marrakesh world, where extensive work on limitations and exceptions for other areas have been discussed at SCCR, as we heard earlier from the new proposal on the LNE by the African group at SCCR, um, any new WIPO treaty must have proper, robust, uh, mandatory limitations and exceptions. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you and I'll hand over back to Teru to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. And uh, it would be great afterwards if uh, we could, um, if you could share your slides as well. I found them very useful. And um, now I'll turn it over to you, Teresa Nobre. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tiro. Um, I don't have slides, and I, I think I might uh, say some of the same things that Teresa said, because I, I was thinking in approaching uh, this, uh, this issue and this problem of lack of exceptions in the, in the current draft treaty from the perspective of educators and researchers. And of course, uh, educators and, and researchers rely much on libraries and archives. So some of the, of the issues uh, that uh, these institutions uh, face uh, have an impact also on educators and researchers. So as Teresa said, um, much of the content that broadcasters transmit play an essential role, not only in culture, but also in education, in research for informational purposes. And, and I think this is particularly the case in our current uh, settings where so many of us uh, enjoy of audiovisual content. And we can even say that our society is very much based in audio and visual content today. So when you think about that broadcasters and, and, and the, the content they broadcast uh, as, as a, an even more important role to play. And, and the archives, so radio and television archives, they are fundamental to access to, access to knowledge and information. And you think Teresa gave some examples of, of interesting archives, and but if you think about uh, important news reporting about the war, about the pandemic, so there are certain um, 
certain recordings, certain re reports that only exist um, in the archives of, of broadcasters, speeches by politicians, etc. They were not registered by any other means uh, than uh, broadcast. So they are, of course, extremely important to learn about our history and to and, and to have access to knowledge and information. But they are also important sources of scientific research and they are also used as education materials. So it's essential for education, uh, for educators, students, scientists, researchers to have access and, and a broad immediate access to broadcast content. Um, and this is the case even with the current draft of the treaty, which as we know, and as we heard has been reduced, uh, but still the need for those robust, robust limitations and exceptions for certain public interest activity, activities remains, uh, uh, especially or, or more, more importantly, when the legal protection of broadcasters is shaped in the form of exclusive rights, which is still uh, the, the, the preferred form of protecting, uh, of give, providing protection to, to broadcasters. Since the primary focus of the treaty, of, as, as it is right now, is on protecting broadcasters against unauthorized retransmissions, the limitations and exceptions should particularly allow uses that involve retransmissions or acts of retransmission. And here, of course, educational uses, uh, uh, particularly due to, during the pandemic, but since the pandemic come to mind. So everyone knows we had a massive dis disruption of the ways education is normally organized. So distance education, uh, became quite the new normal uh, since this, the, the, schools, the schools have closed. And as schools started to reopen or continue in hybrid formats or even were forced to move to this education due to other reasons. So think about wars, think about natural disasters. It's not, it's not only the pandemic that uh, forces uh, this shift to remote environments. So as they reopen or, or move to, to these other um, hybrids or uh, distance formats, uh, it's still an important feature of education today, uh, the possibility to provide education remotely, also to provide education that is digitally supported. And this includes not only online learning, but also broadcast-based learning. So as Teresa mentioned, radio and TV-based broadca broadcasts, uh, broadcasts or remote learning re-emerged in the past year uh, in response to the pandemic. Actually, the data that I have that comes also from, from other studies say that during the peak of the pandemic, TV-based learning was offered by 87% of all countries worldwide, and radio-based uh, remote learning was offered by 61%, with low-income and middle-income uh, countries relying more heavily on broadcast media. So the present draft uh, treaty should definitely uh, anticipate this uh, this. Uh, new ways of providing education and should mandate uh, specifically uh, exceptions and limitations that allow the retransmission of broadcasts by educators. But the retransmission of broadcast programs might also occur in other contexts that are uh, equally important, namely for uh, legitimate research activities. Think about uh, big collaborative text and data mining projects. Uh, since TDM involves archiving and making available the source materials in order to uh, permit scientific uh, verification of the results, we also would need a, a, an exception and limitation uh, for scientific research problems. Now, as, as it was already mentioned, the problem with the draft text is, it, is that it only says that countries may extend the same exceptions that exist for copyright, uh, but obviously countries can choose not to do this. And, and obviously this also has a problem because what we are saying is that countries may extend the same exceptions that exist for copyright, but cannot have broader exceptions than those that exist for copyright, which is quite uh, uh, um, 
quite out of the norm, I would say. I've looked at many uh, exceptions and limitations across the world for various purposes. And normally the rule is that the exceptions for neighboring rights are much broader uh, in terms of scope of protection than the exceptions for, um, for copyrighted works. And, and therefore this restriction to only allow exceptions um, that are similar or that go to the same extent that those that exist for copyright um, is quite unusual and, 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 and honestly unjustified. Of course, the draft treaty as it is, since it only has optional exceptions and no mandatory exceptions, ends up being more restrictive than the Berne Convention. So we recall that the Berne Convention adds exceptions for news of the day and for quotations, and the quotation exception is fundamental across uh, uh, a significant number of activities that have uh, a public interest behind them. So not having at least mandatory exceptions, uh, uh, mandatory quotations for broadcasting is absolutely unacceptable. Um, but in addition to, the, to this, it should also say, you know, if, if there's no mandatory exceptions for education and, res and research, should at least say the same things that the Berne Convention say, which is, it is permissible to have exceptions for education and research. So uh, really, I think, uh, disregarding the exceptions and limitations provision in the in the in the draft treaty might lead us to really uh, interesting, surprising uh, 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 results that broadcasts are subject to fewer exceptions than the underlying works that they are broadcasting. Um, so uh, we definitely uh, recommend uh, that this is. Uh, uh, looked more intensely by the, by the delegates. And, and I, I think the Education International has commissioned a study on, um, on copyright and remote teaching. And I think it's, it's gonna be very revealing the importance of having exceptions and limitations uh, to neighboring rights that are applicable um, to, uh, uh, to, 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 um, for educational purposes through this study, because one of the, the findings of this study that will be released in a couple of weeks is that, for instance, in Latin America and the Caribbean, there is a lack of exceptions applicable to materials that are protected by neighboring rights. And, and, and therefore, uh, even if the countries have broad exceptions to copyright, and some have uh, that are applicable uh, in educational contexts, uh, if, if the teacher wants to use a broadcast, um, it ends up not being able to do so, not because there is no exception for copyright, but because there is no exception to the neighboring rights. So uh, this is actually a current problem and, and, and therefore should not be uh, uh, led to a, uh, to, to, a, to, to a place where, um, where no attention is paid to it, paid to it uh, as, as it has been the case so far. So in sum, uh, our position has been that in order to avoid creating these new obstacles uh, uh, to access to knowledge and information, uh, there should be a minimum set of exceptions uh, and limitations for education, research, preservation, uh, uh, and, and, and other essential uses. Um, and I think in, in, that, in that sense, a position that follows the proposals made by Brazil and Chile in the past could be uh, a, good, uh, a good position, but at least, at least a minimum set of mandatory exceptions for uses that are re already required by the existing treaties, so quotations, news of the day, Marrakesh Treaty, this should be there. And, and, and even if we decide to keep everything else uh, on an optional basis, there's better ways to draft uh, that, uh, that possibility. And, and I would say that in that case, uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement has a much more interesting provision because it mandates, uh, it makes it mandatory for member states or for members of that, uh, um, of that agreement to provide an appropriate balance in its copyright system. So it makes it mandatory to have that balance. Uh, and then 
makes it optional to decide which exceptions should, should those countries have in place. So I, I would say that's the, the bare minimum if you want to have an optional provision or a, a flexible that doesn't mandate non-binding provision that you at least mandate uh, the, the, the balance to have an appropriate balance in the copyright system. So I think that's it from my side. Thank you. To... Thank you so much, Teresa. And now Louise, uh, I, I see Mariana Fernandez, but I think that's, we can safely say that's you, Louise Villarroel. So over to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Thiru, for the invitation and uh, the organizers. Uh, and uh, thank you to, to my colleagues in this panel because they, they have presented uh, very clearly, you know, examples of uh, exceptions, uh, particular exceptions ne ne needed uh, for libraries and archives and, and, and education and also in general uh, public interest concerns. And, and if you allow me, uh, I, I will share uh, uh, a small uh, PowerPoint uh, just to, to to summarize, you know, what I would like to to, to tell. Uh, on a, in general, uh, we we see that there are uh, some public interest uh, failures in the the proposed uh, chair specs, and, uh, and if we could summary, we would say. Uh, the, the current uh, text uh, it makes very difficult to provide exceptions that we, we know that we need, uh, and because an issue of uh, interpretation of what it means the three-step test, and uh, and also uh, don't give any incentive to provide th those exceptions. Also, uh, very important, uh, it don't address the, the issue of uh, orphan broadcast problem. We all know how difficult it is to identify the right holders for copyright uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and related rights. Uh, now I cannot imagine you know, how we are going to, to deal with the, the issue of orphan broadcast, uh, especially after they have been uh, recorded. And, and we are talking about a, a transmission uh, over uh, uh, already fixed uh, signal. <clears throat> Uh, the, the other uh, uh, important uh, uh, failure of, of the proposed text is that it do, do not address the issue of uh, the, the, the contracts overriding the exceptions. Uh, and this is particularly uh, important in the case uh, of the right holders that have a, a very strong uh, market power. Uh, so uh, and we, we, we see that this will be very difficult. Uh, also, the uh, other uh, provision that is missing is that we, we, we don't have a, a public order uh, a provision like, like we have the Berne Convention in, in Article 17, or we have in TRIPS uh, uh, with uh, national security. Uh, and, and in particular, uh, we, we see missing a provision with, with regard to, to the mandate of protection of competition, which is one of the provisions that was presented uh, I think uh, by Chile uh, on, uh, on a, in, in the first years uh, of the discussions, because uh, again, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, rights that might be conferred to extremely big platforms. And, and we know the uh, abuse of market position uh, is uh, horrible uh, even today when, when there is not such right. <clears throat> uh, as Teresa mentioned, it, it, it doesn't uh, even uh, realize that we, we are in a world now that we, we, we are under uh, a, a lot of uh, dangers and, uh, and and we see global emergencies uh, uh, arising at any time, uh, 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 even in addition to pandemics. So, and, 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 and we are talking in another force, the need to have a, a preparedness uh, treaty for pandemics. And, and, and here it seems that we are in the perfect world. So, so we need to, to to keep that in mind. Uh, also, so quick question, uh, um, Luis, could you, if it's possible for you to put your presentation in full presentation mode? Uh, uh, I, yes, my friend, I I will you. try. I think this is full presentation mode. Okay. Yes. Okay. So so so, and also there is no provision for uh, less developed countries, uh, and, and and there is an, an, a number of o o other concerns, uh, like cultural diversity, that are not included, and also that were presented at some point. Uh, so uh, let, 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 let me 
do a, a very brief uh, analysis of the current uh, provision for uh, exceptions, which is very important to have it clear. Here we have a provision that in the uh, in, in Article 10.1 provides that a country might have the exception that uh, already provides in their national law for copyright and related right. So you might say, well, then you are going to have the same exception that for copyright. But you have paragraph two, and, and paragraph two say now in, in a mandatory way. The other was you can you might have. Uh, provisions uh, of, of exception like copyright, but then uh, Article 2 say, but you have to confine those exceptions for broadcast to the three-step test. So, for example, you will have exception for education, you have an exception for education and copyright, but then, I mean, that's permitted for one, but then Article 2 confines the exception that you will have for broadcasts in education, to the test of the three-step test. So, reduces even the scope that you will have for a, 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 a work, you know, a copyrighted work. So, so it, it, it really uh, uh, makes it very difficult to, uh, to have an, a, a limitation uh, because it's, well, in the first place, it's very difficult to interpret to, to interpret, you know, what those means, you know, the, the three-step test, uh, but also it provides uh, uh, no incentives for have exceptions. Uh, on the contrary, I mean, it will be pain if you go for an exception and you will tend to have it the, 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 the smaller that you can. Uh, so, so what is what, what we, we we need? Well, it has been clearly said we we need to have mandatory exception. That that is, uh, I mean, in in a world where we have a, a a treaty for exception like the Marrakesh Treaty, we are discussing a treaty for libraries and educations of mandatory exception. It, it's like a parallel world that, that here we, we, we are uh, keeping the, the old model that we know that doesn't work. So we, we need mandatory exceptions. Uh, we have mandatory provision for orphan broadcast. We, we, we have to, to come up with a system, an obligation to come up with a system to identify broadcast to make uh, easier uh, the distribution of rights, you know, uh, to the broadcast, but also to uh, make possible to, to, to get licenses, and if not, then, then uh, to, to allow the, the, the use. Also, uh, as well, we, we need provision of mandatory uh, no override of, uh, of compensation by contracts. Uh, we, we, we need to, as well, to provide a, a provision mirroring uh, uh, Article 17 of Berne Convention to to to, to make sure that the countries uh, have the power uh, to protect you know public order in, uh, with regard to broadcast and uh, it seems uh, 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 almost a no-brainer that we should provide in this uh, treaty as well uh, uh, a space uh, uh, to uh, respond in case of global emergencies and uh, uh, pandemics are other. I mean, like it, we, we, we are uh, you know, facing global warming. We don't know what's going to happen in, in, in a few years. And uh, so, so then uh, are we going to keep the same rule or, or we will have a, a, a space for doing this? Uh, and, and to finish, uh, Thiro, I don't know how many seconds I have. Do I have three seconds? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, okay. Please. Okay. So, so so it's, it's very important. Uh, 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 it's, it's, it's very important to, to 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 remember what is in the Rome Convention. I mean, because we, we are updating a treaty on broadcast, and and the, and the, the 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 president is Rome Convention and trips. And as has been already said, and now you, you have the proof because I have the article there, there, there is no three-step test in, a, in, in Rome Convention, nor in TRIPS for uh, broadcast. In the case of uh, Rome Convention, there is a, a list of permitted uh, safe harbors uh, that we need to update, but there is the list. And then it provides uh, the provision that uh, you can have the same exception that copyright. But, but there is no... Uh, Mandatory three-step uh, in in this case. Also, if you if you look on on what are the exceptions for broadcasting in trips, is Article 14.6, and uh, the the only standard for broadcast is to follow. The, I mean, the exception to rights uh, in in trips for broadcast is the Rome Convention. So again, even trips 
do not apply to step test uh, to broadcast. So Article 13 of TRIPS only applies for a uh, copyright. Uh, and uh, and, and in particular, I uh, uh, have to make the argument that. Uh, that, that, that the worst scenario is the three-step test because, as I say, it's very difficult to make an interpretation. What does mean uh, normal uh, use uh, exploitation of a work for a broadcast? Is what is usual done by a broadcast? Uh, is what is normally done? I mean, in the sense of ordinary, or is as has been said in in by, by, by the trips panels is uh, according to a norm. But then the question, what is the norm with regard to what is uh, what should be the exploitation of a work? So, so extremely difficult uh, 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 to, uh, to, 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 to really understand what does it mean to apply the three-step test. Also, uh, uh, the, uh, the three-step test punish if you provide an exception that is bigger than the three-step test requires. But there's no... Uh, any punishment if you don't provide the exception that the public interest need. So we need to solve that. We need to generate an incentive, uh, a legal incentive uh, for to provide the exceptions. Uh, and uh, so, so definitely uh, the three-step test is, is the worst uh, that, that we can think. Uh, and, and, and an example of what was a exception, uh, I mean, a, a provisional exception already uh, presented in, in the in, in the SCR committee, in, in this case by Chile, well, personally, I, I, I wrote it, I, I might say, uh, uh, the, then it, it, it provides a list of exceptions that are uh, uh, permitted as a safe harbor and also uh, creates a, a, a broad uh, standard with, with mirrors the three-step test, but with a, a, a public interest uh, consideration, because then when providing the exception, we need to take it in, in account the legitimate interest of the parties, so means also the users. Uh, so in conclusion, we need mandatory exceptions, mandatory offer broadcast uh, provision, uh, no override of contracts, public order provision, and uh, mandatory global emergencies provision. Thank you, Thiru, and thank you to all for your patience. Thank you so much, and that rounds up um, uh, at least the panelist sections for our uh, duration of the WIPO broad proposed broadcasting treaty. And uh, before we turn to uh, a discussion, uh, I would ask uh, um, my, our co-host Vitor uh, 